And he can be present here in Champaign County. But it comes by tuning our hearts to him, fasting and praying. So we're going to spend 40 days in preparation for Easter. And then once Easter happens, what happens 40 days after that? Pentecost. And so, so we're going we're gonna to have the road to the cross as the sermon series leading to Easter. And then as soon as that happens, we're going we're gonna to do seven weeks on preparation. Because the reality is the cross was the beginning point. It wasn't the end. And God chooses to use us for it. And so we will actually spend 40 days in prayer. And we will have prayer and fasting within that time. We will have a, and it may be hard for me because I have two kids. No, it, it'll be great. We're going to do, we're going to do 24 hours of prayer at one point where we will have the sanctuary open 24 hours. We're going to let you guys sign up for an hour to come in and we're going to, we're going to have prayer sheets. We're going to have people, we're going to invite people to come in and pray, but it is going to be a time of preparation for what God wants to do through us for this community. When Pentecost happened, the Holy Spirit showed up and everybody went out and, and people came to know Christ because they were, they, were, they were used by God. That's my desire for us as a church, is that we would be used by God to lead people to Jesus. And so that's going to be our next 80 days, so hold on. It's going to be, it's going to be a, 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 a good journey, but I am excited for what God is going to do. And so we start the road next week, and then we have, we have our prepare series. But just some quick announcements of, of what is coming up. Ash Wednesday, like we said, Wednesday night. Make sure you're here. It'll be a great time of learning and, and reflection on, on the start of the Lenten season, <coughs> on the start of the preparation season for us. Um, also, Easter, we will have, um, Easter Sunday, we will have some activities for the kids, but our Easter egg hunt uh, will be on a different day. Right now, we're looking at a date. Um, we will get that information to you, and, and that way you can pass it out to people. Um, but we're looking at a, a, a different date right now to do that. So we'll have that coming up. Um, also, Gather at the Table is coming up in two weeks, I think. I think I did the math right on that. Um, but it'll be the first week of March. Make sure you invite someone to come with. They don't have to come to church to come and eat with us. If, if they're not comfortable, hey, we got good food. We got maca clear cake and things. Come and, come and join us. Come and eat with us. Come and be a part of what God is doing here. Um, so we have that coming up. Also, we have our sign-ups in the back for a ladies' day. If you're interested in that, make sure you sign up. Um, and let them know there may be some carpooling for that. And then also John, who is sick, pray for John and Macy. They, they're both under the weather this morning. Um, he is seeking people to help serve in our, as our greeters. We are seeking people to help serve in our nursery. Um, and so if you want to sign up for that, make sure you sign up in the back and let us know that you're willing to serve. Nothing happens without people serving. Um, you know, the, the reality is that, that if, if positions need to be filled, it requires people to fill them, and, and we are the ones that do that. So if you're willing to serve and want to serve, uh, we appreciate that so much. Um, but we are excited for the things that God is doing going forward um, and, and how he's moving. Uh, missions, Zone Mission Rally. <coughs> That's right. Al <coughs> Alabaster Offering will be next Sunday. So make sure you got your coins. We'll have the, the house up here. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Alabaster, Alabaster goes to build churches and parsonages and do mission work around the world. Um, we are a global denomination in 164 world areas, um, and that's that is where your alabaster goes. So make sure um, make sure that you you um, make sure that you you get your your coinage ready uh, for next week. And um, um, zone mission rally. I, my my brain went zone mission rally here Wednesday night, March 15th. Um, and the missionary's name just left me. Twill, Shahadi Twal, is a, a missionary from Germany. He will be here. It's on a Wednesday night, so make sure you're here. It'll be a great time. It'll be everybody from our mission zone, Ogden, Rantoul, Monticello, us, um, and Urbana. Um, and so make sure you come and be a part of that. Mark your calendar for that Wednesday night uh, to come and to hear what God is doing on the mission field uh, that we support. But we are so excited. We're gonna, I think we're, we're ready to rock and roll, so we're going we're gonna to pray, and then we are going to... Um, Worship the Lord this morning, but uh, but I want to pray and uh, let's ask God to to show up as we are expecting Him to. God, we thank you for today. Thank you that you are good, God. No matter what happens um, in the ups and the downs of life, God, on the mountaintops and God, yes, even in the valleys, you are good. God, when when it seems as all hope is lost, God, you are good. 
And, and God, we, wanna, we just want to come and we want to say that this morning, that you are awesome and magnificent. God, you are, uh, you are just the, the epitome of every superlative that we can ever think of and even more. God, our words just don't do justice to your goodness. So God, we want to praise you this morning and we want to we want to shout amen and thank you for the things that you've done, God, not just in Wilmer, Kentucky over the last 10 days, but God, what you're doing here and the life transformation that's happening here, God, and, and we may not have heard about it, but God, you're moving and you're working. We believe you for it. God, we believe you for, for kingdom growth. We believe you for the harvest, God. You, you tell us in your word that, that the harvest is plentiful. God, and if you declare it as plentiful, then that means it's far beyond anything we can imagine. And so we thank you for that. God, thank you for the peace and, and, the, and the deliverance and the repentance and the, the reconciliation that's happened over the last 10 days of not just in Wilmore, but just because of Wilmore. We're hearing stories of southwest Louisiana and, and Indiana and, and Mount Vernon and all these other places where you are showing up. And God, we ask that you would do that today. Consecrate this place as your holy ground, that you would be here, that you would speak, that you would move, God, and that we would be changed, not for our benefit, but that people would come to know you. God, use us as your hands and feet. God, change us, make us, mold us to be more like you. We will give you the praise and glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we worship the Lord this morning? still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass, my heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in
truth, that you will not fail. Your promises are true, God, and we can stand upon them. God, you are faithful. God, I pray this morning that whatever it is that we're going through, God, right now, whether we're coming out of a valley, whether we're going into a valley, whether we're in the bottom of the valley, God, I pray that your faithfulness will ring true. God, I pray that if we know somebody who is in the valley, God, would you help us to, to share the truth of your faithfulness that you have, you promised to never leave us or forsake us, God, that your faithfulness is true. And God, we just believe that this morning. We thank you for that this morning.
the veil tore before you, you silenced the most of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, you have no can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus what a powerful name it is the name of jesus God, we come to you today so grateful, Jesus, that we can come before you, our creator and our savior, and just simply worship you, Lord. Just be in awe of who you are and of the sacrifice that you gave for us because of your love for us, of your great, sacrificial, unyielding, big love that you have for each and every one of us, Lord, regardless of who we are, where we've come from, Father, we rest in the fact that we are yours and you love us, Jesus. Father God, I ask that you will just come speak to our hearts. Lord, you know what each one is going through. Father, there's some big battles being fought here today. But God, you know exactly what the need is in every single life here. I pray that you will open our hearts, open our minds. Just give us peace, Lord, as we listen to Pastor, as he brings your words that you've given him this week. Change us, Father. Make us better. Make us more like you, Jesus. Let us love like you, Jesus. We love you in your precious, holy, strong name we pray. Amen.
try this again. <laughs> Amen. As, as that is that better there we go we are we are currently working on our sound system kind of learning to use it a little bit more and so um but as i have loved you love one another that is not that is not a uh that's not an option that's not a suggestion that is not a um we hope you will that is not a if you want to that is a command of jesus as the father has loved me and i have loved you love one another. It's not an option. And as I've been studying, we we finish, if you haven't been with us, if you're just joining us for the first time in person or online, we're so glad you're here. Um, We are finishing this morning a series called Love One Another. And we are looking at the ways that we are called to love people. We're looking at the ways that we are called to love the people around us, the the people in our family, our community, um, around the world. And so the first week we talked about what it means to love one another unconditionally. So what does it mean to love unconditionally? We know, we know that word for love, agape, that, that is the all-encompassing, unconditional love of Jesus for the world. We are called to do the same. And so we looked at the fact that it calls for us to surrender and to sacrifice and, and to, to love those that may not love us back, to love radically in, in, in a way that just just reaches the, the uttermost and lavishes on people and, and we don't hesitate and, and those, who, those who may be our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies, right? That's probably the hardest one. Um, but we learned about what, what it means to be unconditionally loving of one another. And then last week we talked about the fact that love, real love, true love, the way Jesus meant it is not just me telling Joni, hey, I love you. That's well and good, but if I never showed her that I loved her, if I never gave her a tangible representation of my love for her, our marriage would probably be terrible. If Jesus, from his throne in heaven, as triune God, said, hey, I love you, but never left the throne and made his way down to a broken world and a broken body and died on a cross for us, would we really have understood it? Tangible love, real love, tangible love is, is what Jesus calls for us to love one another with, which means we need to go and we need to be willing to physically love one another, to share and to, to, to reach out and touch somebody. As, as I was talking this week with someone, to give a hug to someone who may need it, to love somebody. And this morning as we finish up, <coughs> excuse me, as we finish up, we're looking at what it means to love one another radically. How many of you know that, that as you read through um, the Gospels, so the, the first four books in the New Testament, if you're not familiar, the first four books in the New Testament are known as the Gospels. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' time on earth. And throughout that, we see Jesus go about places. He does things. He heals people. He, he casts out demons. He turns water into wine. He feeds 5,000. He teaches this big, long sermon from a mountain. Um, really, it's like a large hill, but you know, in Illinois, it would be a mountain. Um, you know, he does all these things, and it's this eyewitness account. But the reality of Jesus' tangible love on earth, the things that he did, it was radical. Because there were the, the, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the ones who were entrusted to the Levitical law, they were the ones who knew front and back the law. And more often than not, when Jesus would do something, the Pharisees would be like, why is he doing that? That's not how that's supposed to work. He's not doing the way it's supposed to be. He's, he's acting out differently. The people in the church didn't like how Jesus was loving. It was radical. And really and truly, some of the people, and we'll look at it today, some of the people that he was loving, their culture probably didn't like Jesus loving them because it was radical. It was not something that was done. And so what does that look like for us 2,000 years later? Well, not quite 2,000. 1990 years later, what does it look like for us today to radically love people the way that Jesus radically loved people in his day and age? And so this morning as we dive in, 
We're going to be in the same passage that we've been in. It's based, based out of the um, same passage, John 15, which this verse is referenced out of. Um, and so if you would, in reverence of the reading of God's word, if you can, would you stand with me? John 15, chapter 9, I'm sorry, John chapter 15, verse 9, says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Praise God that Jesus loves us. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will be overflowing. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay one's life down for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything that the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love one another. Father, we thank you that you came and you exemplified, God, what it meant to love one another. God, you showed as the disciples walked with you for three years. God, they saw so many tangible examples of children running up to you when people wanted to cast them away. God, of beggars being made made to have sight and of lame people being made to walk again, and paralytics getting up off of a mat in the middle of a house and walking out to the astonishment of everybody who witnessed it. To you healing lepers and, 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 and raising the dead, God, to casting out. You did so many things that showed love for people. God, in, in your command in this passage says that we are called to do the same, to love as you have loved. So God, I pray that you would help us this morning to understand what it means to love radically, that we can love our community radically, that we can love our world radically. God, that lives would be transformed, that healing would occur, and that you would be made famous and glorified. God, it's not about us or anything we do. It's about you and you alone. And so God, I pray this morning that you would teach us. God, help us to learn, change us, move us, make us more like you for your glory and your kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I love, I love in this passage that, that greater love has none than to lay one's life down for his friend. That's pretty radical, isn't it? When, when, when Jesus walked the earth, I think if he would have polled the disciples, even in the early in their ministry and even late in their ministry, three years later, they didn't understand what he was doing. You know, one of them no, no, you, where, where you go, we're going too. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do what you do. We're following you all the way. No, you don't understand where I'm going and what I'm doing. I go to prepare a place for you. But if you would have pulled the Pharisees, if you would have pulled the, the disciples, if you would have pulled the people who experienced Jesus early on and said, you know, what is the epitome of love? I think we would have gotten a gamut of answers. I think if we did that today, we would have gotten a gamut of answers. But, but Jesus says right here, there is no greater love than to lay one's life down for their friends. For him physically, you know, but, but in the parenthetical ideology of it, it's the sacrifice. It's my life doesn't matter, but yours does. It's, it's the radical nature of you first, me second. There's, there's a... Um, campaign it's been going on for probably 10 years now i was trying to find out how long it's been going on <coughs> excuse me um and it's called i am second and the whole premise of it it's a christian campaign and there's there's wristbands and stuff and there's all, all kinds of famous people actors athletes um people who have gone up and they've given testimony of the fact that you know i am second and what it says is when i give my life to jesus when i start following him when i surrender to what he wants in my life. We in the church of the Nazarene call it sanctification. It's a big, long Christianese word. But really and truly what it means is it means a full surrender of our lives. God, not my will, but yours now. Fully. I don't want to hold on to any of it anymore. It's not like I got one hand on the wheel and you got one hand on the wheel. You're driving the car now. You have it all. And, and, and what that means is, you know, my life is not my own. You do with it as you please. I will go where you send me. I will do what you want me to do. It is the, it's the prayer of Isaiah when he's in the presence of the Lord and he is just overwhelmed when, when, when the Lord says, whom shall I send and whom will go for me? There's a, there is a wicked world out there. There are things out there that need 
to be shared truth. Who will go for me? And Isaiah goes, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I come from a people of unclean lips. I am not anybody, but I'll go. Here I am, Lord, send me. And, and that is us. It's, God, I don't have anything to offer but myself, but you can have it and use it as you want. That, that, that surrender, that sacrifice, is laying one's life down for one's friends. It means that if God says to you and pricks your heart that he wants you to go and do something or go somewhere or go and be with somebody that's hurting, you put your agenda aside. You pause your schedule. You go and you do. <clears throat> and Jesus, and he exemplified that in a lot of different ways. It means that when things are really, really, really messy, and maybe when we go and love that person, we get a little messy too. And, and for us clean Christian people, right, we don't like that often. You know, we, that's, a little bit, that's a little bit out there, God, I'm not sure. Jesus exemplified that kind of radical love as well. The radical love of Jesus met people in the midst of their brokenness. The radical love of Jesus met people in their valley, in their deepest, darkest valley, so that they could have hope, so that they could have life, so they could experience the love of Christ. Loving one another radically means that we too need to meet people in the midst of their brokenness and in the depths of their valley. One great example of this is, is a little bit earlier um, in Jesus' travels. You know, we know the story, if you've been around the church of any length of time, it happens in John chapter 4. You know, Jesus, they're on this journey, and, and, and typically this passage from, you know, it, it was, there was a road, um, if you were to draw, how many of you know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line? I'm a geography degree, I'm a geography graduate, so spatially, that's, that speaks to my soul. So I, if you ever hear me say, as a crow flies, that's what I mean, it's a straight line. Um, the straight line from Jerusalem to Jericho was through an area called Samaria. And so often when, when Jewish people would travel, it would make sense that they would go along that straight line. But the problem was Samaria was not a place that Jewish people went. Why? Because it was Chicago and St. Louis, the Cubs and the Cardinals. You just didn't go there. I grew up in Ohio, and so the big rivalry in Ohio was Ohio State-Michigan. And the cool thing about Ohio State-Michigan rivalry is there's a, an actual state line divider and so I know so many people that are like, I, when I go to the Michigan game, I don't fill up my gas. I fill up in Toledo before I cross the border because I don't want any of that Michigan gas. You know, it's, it's this dividing. Like, you just don't go there. And I know I'm making light of this, but in that day and age, that's really what it was times a 100, times a 1,000. Samaritans and Jews, they didn't intermix. Jews saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. Dogs is what they called them. And because of that, the Samaritans hated the Jews as well. They didn't want anything to do with them. Stay out of my country. Go around. We don't want you here. And in John chapter 4, Jesus does something so radical that even his disciples are like, what are we doing here? He goes dead center into Samaria. Middle of the day. Now, I've never been to the Middle East, but I understand it's pretty hot. I lived in Texas and Louisiana for about 13 years, and I understand that it can get really hot down there. But I, I imagine that it was a whole lot hotter down there during this time because they didn't have air conditioning. Um, and, and it was, it's middle of the desert, middle of the day, Jesus shows up at this well. This well that was built back in the day by people that were in the lineage. And he meets this woman at this well. She's a Samaritan woman. Now back then, men and women didn't mix. So you have Samaritan and Jew doesn't mix, men and women that don't mix. Like, there's all kinds of radical in this place right now. And Jesus meets this woman at this well. And, and she shows up. She has brokenness in her life. The reality is she's been married. She's had five husbands, and the man that she's with right now isn't her husband. She's got a ton of brokenness. She's ridiculed by her own people. And so instead of going to get water at the cool of the day, she shows up in the midday sun. If you were to paint a picture of the epitome of her brokenness, the epitome of her hurt, the epitome of her heartache, the epitome of every aspect of the brokenness of her life, it would have been that well at midday. And Jesus could have met her at her house at night under the cover of darkness. He could have met her away from people. He could have met her anywhere else, but he met her in the midst of her brokenness because she was there. 
And we know the interaction. He says, you know, hey, I'm thirsty. Can you give me a drink? And, and she says, you know, I have nothing to draw water from. And it goes on and he says, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would ask him for the living water that doesn't run dry. And he meets, this, he meets this woman in the midst of her brokenness, in the depth of her brokenness. And he dwells with her in it. He didn't say, hey, it's hot out here. Let's go inside. He didn't say, hey, you know, it's kind of awkward being here with, these, with you as you're a Samaritan, I'm a Jew. Let's go find a group of people we're around, you know, because we don't want any impropriety, right? There, there, there's none of that. He says, look, the only thing that matters right now is you. You and it sounds terrible. I don't want to say it and mean it the wrong way. You are the agenda. You are the appointment that I have. You are the only thing that matters. Her in the midst of the depth of her valley, Jesus met her. And because of that, because of that interaction, her life was radically transformed. And she runs back to the town where she is despised by people. She probably didn't interact with people because more often than not, it would have been ridicule. She runs back and she tells everybody, look, you've got to come and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. You've got to come and see this Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the one that we've been foretold about. I met him. Come and see. And it says that the entire town was transformed because of it. Because Jesus chose to go and to meet somebody in the depth of their valley because he knew that they mattered. Praise God for the lives that have been transformed because that Samaritan woman was transformed, because that town was transformed, the generational salvation that came with it. Praise God for that. We don't, we don't, it doesn't even say that in here. We don't talk about that. But man, the lineage that comes from that. Praise God because Jesus was willing to go and dwell in brokenness. What does that look like for you and me? Because we don't have Jacob's well in the middle of the day. We have bottled water. I've got some right there. <clears throat> we, we don't have those things. What does it look like for us? When I was early as a pastor, I, I, I've dealt with um, a lot of different things. I've dealt with a lot of hurt and a lot of heartache and a lot of tragedy. I've dealt with a lot of, of, of things that I've struggled with. I've asked God, why? Why, God? I don't understand this. Whether it was my mom being diagnosed with breast cancer, we didn't know. You know, um, I, I shared with Joni, you, you've heard me tell the story of Dr. Larry Nelson, <clears throat> one of my favorite professors in college who had brain cancer. And I told Joni the, earlier this week, um, I'm not going to share the whole story, but when he passed away, I, I got in my car and I drove. Well, first I broke down and cried. Then I got in my car and drove. And I yelled at God because I didn't understand. I don't understand, God, why? Why does this happen? I don't get it. It makes us angry and frustrated. There are people all around us that are dwelling in that, that have no clue of the hope of Jesus in the midst of their struggles. And we, and we, and we want to go in and we want to give them the words. But there are no words. And I was told early in my ministry, there's, there's a thing called the ministry of presence. I don't think it was necessarily the words of Jesus that transformed the life of the Samaritan woman that day. I think it was the presence of the Holy Spirit through God in the flesh as Jesus that she saw the hope that came with it. And, and for us, there are no words. You are going to be with people in the midst of their brokenness, and you're going to want to give them some word of encouragement or some word of hope, and it's not going to be there. It's going to fall empty. But your presence with them in the valley, with God dwelling through you, will speak to their soul. And his presence will do the transformation. What does that look like for us? I, I, I'm, I'm going to share a story of, of somebody that I, I found out this week. I've been um, walking with them for a while. It's, it's somebody that I went to high school with. Um, we weren't really close friends. We played football together. Um, but we weren't really good friends, um, and so it wasn't that this is a best friend or somebody like that, but he and his wife have, um, they have a couple kids, they have one son, he's five, um, and he has dealt with some struggles throughout his life. He's five years old, he's already had many heart issues, things like that. Well, this week, um, he was diagnosed with coronary artery disease. Prognosis isn't good. Um, and, and so here's this five-year-old son um, who knows no different. 
um, and and they're, we're praying and believing God for for a miracle that he'll get on the transplant list that God will heal him. But we don't know. There's no, there's no, we, the, the prognosis for something like that is not good. And, and my friend posted on Facebook um, this big long rant of, of pain and hurt and heartache and brokenness and frustration and anger and every other adjective that you can think of. And in that moment, I broke, I broke. Like, I, I don't know what other word to use. Like, I, my heart just was crushed for him. Because I thought about, what about Morgan and Maddie? What would, what would I do if something happened to them? How would I move? How would I, how would I go? I, I don't know. My heart broke. And I, and, I, and I thought about posting a comment on Facebook, and I, and I thought about it, and I didn't. And, and then I ended up sending him a message, and I just said, you know, hey, I'm so sorry. Like, I have no words that are going to make this situation better. You know, and, and, and I can't guarantee you that it's going to work out okay. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do in this moment. But the one thing that was overwhelming to me was the presence of God for me to say, you know what, but if you are ever in a place where you just feel like you can't go on anymore, you call me. And I will drive the three hours and 15 minutes to Cincinnati and I will be with you in your brokenness. Because I trust that the God of the universe who dwells inside of me will come with me and will somehow through no words comfort you in the midst of your broken nature, in the, in the midst of your valley. Sometimes we've got to go into the valley and dwell with people for God to walk them out of the valley. Sometimes we've got to just go and sit and cry and, and not know, and just be silent. There's no words. And it's easy, I was talking with, with some of our people this week, it's easy to do that when, when I talk about Quentin and Judy, or my parents, my mom went to the, the ER last night and is doing better, but my dad, my dad called or sent a text and said that, it's easy for me to say I'm dropping everything and going to be with my parents. I'm dropping everything, I'm going to be with Quentin and Judy, they're my in-laws. I'm dropping everything and going to be with these, these people in our close circles. But what about the person that's not? What about the person that has no one? What about the person that's, that's, that's on the fringe of our circle? Maybe they've come a little bit, but they're not. Are we willing to drop everything and go? Jesus had a plan on this trip. He was going somewhere. Jesus never went anywhere without purpose. And the Samaritan woman was that stop. Are we willing to forego and sacrifice every aspect of our schedule, our wants, our needs, what we think for the sake of others, to dwell with them in brokenness. That's radical love. It meets people in the valley. But radical love doesn't just meet people in the valley. It raises eyebrows. The radical love of Jesus raised so many, man, it raised so many eyebrows. Pharisees, culture people. I mean, I just, I wonder what the Samaritans thought when Jesus showed up at the well. And they're like, well, a Jewish person was here? It raised eyebrows. One of the things that I, I, I love about Jesus' ministry is he didn't really care what other people thought. He had no care in the world. And I sometimes wonder if the difference between us choosing to love radically and choosing not to love radically is we wonder what people will think, especially people in the church. What will they think if I go and do life with this person, believe in God to do this? What will they think if I, what will people think if I, and if that causes you pause, I challenge you, to love like Jesus loved. Jesus, in, in Luke chapter 7, verse 11 through 14, they were headed to the village of Nain. This large crowd is coming out. You've heard me tell the story. And it's a funeral procession. This widow, she's a widow. She lost her husband, and now she's just lost her only son. And this funeral procession is coming out. <clears throat> and back in that day, Jewish people, and even today, there was what, the, what they call ceremon ceremonial cleanliness. There were things that you didn't do because it made you unclean. And one of the things you didn't do is you didn't ever, ever, ever touch something dead. Ever. Like that was the, you talk about like level 100, that was level 150. You didn't do that. And here comes this funeral procession. And Jesus sees this widow coming. And it says he was overwhelmed with compassion. Here's this widow who lost her only son. She has nobody now. He's overwhelmed with compassion, and he does something so radical that I guarantee you jaws dropped, even his disciples. He reaches out, 
and he touches the casket. That was not something. Now, now, they didn't have caskets like we have caskets, the plush inside with the nice coating on the outside and the metal bars. They, their, their caskets would have been dirty. And Jesus does the most radical thing. He could, he could have said from a distance, get up. We saw him do that, right? But he chose in that moment to reach out and touch the casket. That's radical. And I think, I don't, I don't want to say I know what Jesus was thinking, because I don't, but I, but I believe that, that, that he did things purposely for us to learn. That sometimes we have to do things that are radical, even for the people around us that are so jaw-dropping, to love people because that's what God calls us to do. If God tells you to reach out and touch a casket, it doesn't matter who thinks what, you better do it. If God says, I want you to go love that person that is completely unlovable, you better go do it. In the conversation this week with somebody, I said, if Osama bin Laden was still alive and he walked through our doors, would he be loved in the same way we love our congregation members? Now, I'm not talking about him coming in all armed up, you know, anything like that. I'm talking about him just walking through our doors. Somebody who the world, not just the United States, the world despised. Would we be able to reach out and touch him? Guarantee you if we did... We'd make the news, probably not for good reasons. People would be like, I can't believe they love that guy. He's terrible. The atrocities he's done. You know what? Jesus loves him. And so we should too. Are we willing to do the most radical thing when Jesus calls us to do it? Loving one another calls for us to raise eyebrows. Now, it's not to do it just to raise eyebrows. Not, that's not for us to choose. It's for God to lead and us to follow. When Jesus says, go and love one another, you you better go and love one another. If he says, I want you to go and love this person, you can't say, well, but what might the church think? What might people think? What might, you know, my family think? What might the world think? You better go. And I promise you, I say this from the pulpit. You can, it's on TV. it's, It's marked down. If God tells you to go and love somebody and you go and do it and you catch flack from somebody in this congregation, you come to me and you tell me and we'll have a conversation about it. Because our opinion doesn't matter. His matters. His agenda matters. And so if you go because God tells you and you love somebody and you catch flack from it, you come and talk to me. We'll have a conversation. It'll be a good conversation. And we'll dive into this thing and we'll learn what Jesus means when he says we're called to love people radically. Loving radically not just meets people in their valley. And it doesn't just raise eyebrows, but it crosses all dividing lines. There are no dividing lines in in the kingdom of heaven. There are no racial dividing lines. There are no socioeconomic dividing lines. There are no political dividing lines in the kingdom of heaven. It crosses all dividing lines. We love people who don't love us. And and in this conversation that I had this week with somebody, we were talking about, um, the the story was shared of the the book um, called Unto Holiness, and and the the person shared the story of um, this this northern pastor and this southern pastor who met, um, and, and the story says that the, the southern pastor said, that I haven't hugged a Yankee since before the Civil War. And they met and they hugged and the glory of God showed up. And that's part of our history. It's part of our church history. Because dividing lines were crossed. They were erased. And love happened. Tangible, radical love happened. I can't imagine what the, what the audience thought when that happened. You know, when they saw that, it crosses lines. And in this conversation with this person, they said, I wonder who we need to go and offer a hug to that crosses those dividing lines. In Jesus' time, he taught through parables. And parables were stories that, that delivered a message that was meant to be understood. And one of the greatest that I, that I think explains this crossing of dividing lines is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We know it. It's in Luke 10. Said a man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. We know that's down the road. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, a Levite, walked over and looked at him lying there and also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. 
When he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. He put, them, put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he, told the, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, now go and do the same. We talked about it in the early, earlier, the Samaritans and Jewish people, they didn't cross lines. They didn't. It was a dividing line. They didn't do it. Now, Jesus crossed a dividing line from Jewish to Samaritan. And in this story, he tells it from a different perspective. And he shares the story of three people, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, the despised Samaritan. Now, the priest and the Levite, that's one of their own in the ditch. Like, that's one of us. Who, who of us, if we saw one of us lying on the side of the road, would not stop? That's family. And really and truly, they probably knew him. But it was ceremonial, ceremonial, ceremonially unclean to get in the ditch and touch blood and touch the other things that were in the ditch, trash and feces and all these other things that were in there. It was messy. It was dirty. And so it says they looked at him and turned and walked away. It's not like they were walking on the other side of the road and they might have heard something. Well, what's that? Like they looked at him and chose to pass him by. And here comes this man who if the roles were reversed, would have never, a Jewish person would have never gone into a ditch to care for a Samaritan. If the roles were reversed, he would have died there. But it says he had compassion on him. And he didn't just like toss some money at him or call an ambulance. He got down into the ditch. And he cared for him. And, and then he put him on his donkey, and he took him to an inn, and he cared for him. And then he said, you know what? If the bill runs higher than this, I'll settle up later. That's radical love. Who, is, who, who in this passage is my neighbor? Now go and do the same. It crosses boundary lines. The people who despise you are the ones we are called to love radically. The people who would never, ever, ever reach out a helping hand to you are the ones we're called to radically love because that's what this is about. Radically loving people to the point of transformation. So often when we have conversation with people, we want to meet in the middle, right? That's compromise, 50-50. More often than not, we've got to go 100% of the way before they ever feel comfortable coming back to the middle to have a conversation. We've got to go the full way, just like Jesus came the full way so that we could go with him. We've got to go and do the same. Now, I don't know what radical love looks like to, looks like to you. I don't know whether it's somebody in your life who's, who's dealing with a child whose prognosis is not good. I don't know whether it's, a, it's somebody who's lost a loved one or somebody who's lost a job or somebody who's going through a hard time or somebody who maybe just feels like nobody around them cares. I don't know what it looks like for you. But I know that God wants to use each one of us to love people unconditionally, tangibly, and radically so that they too can know the love of Jesus. You are here because somebody loved you first. I am here because somebody chose to love me first before I ever loved them. Kevin Johnson, he'll tell you, I was probably not the most friendly person in the world, and every day he was there. Hey, man, how you doing? Great job in the game. How'd your test go? For years, loved me before I ever loved him. There are people that need to know that they are loved when the rest of the world passes them by. There are people that need to know they're loved when they're in the depth of their valley. It's really easy to say, hey, Psalm 23 says God's going to walk you through it. Good luck. That's not what Jesus calls us to. He says go down in the valley. Dwell with them. Be the hands and feet that walk them out. Our world is hurting and broken. There are stories every day. People losing loved ones. Tragedies happening. 
We live in a sin-soaked world that deals out brokenness like it's going out of style. The only solution is Jesus. The only solution is Jesus. He is the overflowing joy. He is the hope of our salvation. He is the peace that passes all understanding. He is the overwhelming grace that just floods our soul. And we are the vessels that deliver it. We are the ones who get the opportunity, the privilege to go and be the vessels. Because when God shows up, we catch the overflow of that blessing. When God shows up, you go, man, you're never going to believe what he did. Not to me, but to this, but I just got to, I got a piece of it, I got a splash. And it changes our life too. There are 120,000 people that live in our county. A whole lot of brokenness. A whole lot of people that despise the church because they've been hurt. A whole lot of people that despise other people because they feel like they've been slighted, they've been hurt, they've been broken. There are no words that offer healing, but presence and radical love. So my prayer for us this year, and, 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 and all of this is God's doing, it's not mine. <clears throat> he timed this up. We're entering Easter season. The radical love of Jesus on a cross that died for our sins that we could be in relationship with him. My prayer for the next 40 days is that as we fast and as we pray and as we seek his face, that he would show up and that he would prick our hearts to say, you know what? This is how I want to use you. This is what I want to do through you. This person needs to be loved and I want you to go. I don't care what people say. And that you would go and that we would hear testimony after testimony of what God is doing. And that would ignite a fire so bright that people would want to come and see what was going on. And they too would be loved. And it's a snowball that just rolls down a hill that nobody can stop. The fire of God is falling. The question is, are we going to be willing to catch it and go? He's not going to pour it out on you if you're not willing. He does, he doesn't, he does not pour out the, the things of this world on people who are going to say no. So my prayer is that we would say yes, that we would, that we would go, that we would be willing to go and love radically. I believe each and every one of us know somebody in our lives who needs to be loved radically. Somebody in our lives who needs to, to have somebody come into the valley and just love them where they are. Not tell them that they're doing wrong. Not tell them that they're sinning. Not, tell them that they're, not telling them they're broken. They probably already know that. But they need somebody to just come and dwell and love them. And so this morning as we finish up, before we receive our offering, as we've done so many times over the last few weeks, I want to take time and I want to invite you to come here. And if you can't, make a posture of prayer at your seat. But to come, and I, wanna, I want you to pray, and I want you to ask God that he would open a door for you to go and love that person radically. Believing for transformation. Believing that you, will, that you will be the vessel that will bring healing and hope and joy and grace and mercy to their life. And I believe it starts with us consecrating ourselves and saying, here I am, Lord, send me. I'm willing to go. So would you join with me as, and I'm going to have Jonathan come forward and, and play a little um, as, we, as we pray. But would you join me here? And would you ask God for the opportunity and the prompting and the timing to go and love somebody radically? We all know somebody who needs it. And if you don't pray and ask God that he would open your eyes and send you out into the community, that you would meet somebody who needs to be loved radically. But it's not going to happen without prayer. It's not going to happen without us being willing to go. And so for just a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to take time to pray. And then when we're done, we'll pray and we'll receive our offering and we'll be dismissed. But I, I want us to really and truly earnestly pray and ask God, who would you have me love radically? Who would you have me say, you know what, not my life but yours. Laying my life down for you, I want to come and I want to dwell in your mess. 
I don't care about the uncleanliness. I don't care about what people might think. I don't care about anything else. I care about you because Jesus cares about you. Who would you have me love, Jesus? Who would you have me love radically? God, would you draw into our minds these people? God, would you bring us to a point of surrender and consecrate us for your use so that people's lives would be transformed? Would you, would you bring it to our mind as we pray this morning? Father in heaven, we come and we confess to you that, God, we may have missed the mark prior to now. But thank you, Jesus, that today is a new day and your mercies are new and new opportunities come. So God, would you help us to say yes to you today when you prompt us to go and love someone? God, would you help us to, to not look back in regret, but God, to look forward in opportunity to the things that you want to do. God, what you're doing, would you help us to get involved? God, I pray right now that the names of the people who are coming to mind, God, I pray right now that you would even now work in their lives. God, that you would prepare the way. God, you would begin the work so that when, when we show up, they're like, I've been expecting you and I don't know why. But God, that you would move and that you would work and that the joy of our salvation would be restored. And I pray that lives would be transformed Thank you for testimony of people who have come to know Christ this week. God, as I've been shared with, God, we believe that that will continue and that lives will be transformed and people's lives and generations of lives will be changed just like the Samaritan woman was because of the encounter they have with Christ through us being willing to go. God, would you do it? Ephesians 3.20, big beyond anything we can ask or imagine, God, would you do it again? God, just as it was prayed 50 years ago for the revival to happen again, God, you've done it again. And God, we ask that you would do it again and that you would do it again as you have done. God, would you do it again? It's you who does the work, not us. Thank you, Jesus, that you call us to a radical love. God, one that meets people in their brokenness, one that 
reaches to the lowest valleys, one that raises eyebrows and one that crosses every dividing line that we as humans can put up. God, would you help us to be your hands and feet to do that? We praise you and we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to invite our ushers to, uh, to come and we will receive our offering this morning. Will you go in? Father, we thank you this morning that, God, we can give back to you what you've given to us. God, they may call it a tithe or an offering, God, but really and truly it's just our thanks. So, God, I pray that you would take this thanks and that you would use it, God, to build to build your kingdom, Lord, to reach people, to change lives, to do what you want to do. God, it's not about us. It's about you. Would you do what you want through these finances, through these offerings, through this thanksgiving that we offer? We praise you. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. I will boast in Jesus Christ is death and resurrection. Amen. Well, we in the church uh, believe in the anointing and praying over people for healing. And uh, I've been asked to, uh, to anoint someone today. And the Bible tells us that when those are sick, they, to call upon the elders of the church and to anoint them and pray over them and believe for God's intervention for healing. And so I'm going to have Carolyn come forward um, and we're going to anoint her. Um, and so if if you're able and willing and want to gather around her um, and lay a hand on her as we pray, I'll invite you to come forward and we'll do that um, as we anoint her this morning. Helen, I anoint you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we just, um, God, we come humbly right now, knowing that it is not our prayer, it is not the oil, it is not anything but you that does the work. And so, God, we come right now on behalf of Carolyn. We ask that you would do a work, God, that you would do what she needs you to do, God. Just as we've learned over these past few weeks and as we've studied, the, the blind were healed and the lame walked and, God, the lepers were made clean. God, you can do anything. And so, God, we just pray that you would move and that you would work and that you would heal, that you would meet Carolyn's need this morning. God, we believe in advance for it. And we will praise you and we will thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And we believe you for it. And we ask it in Jesus' powerful and holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm so glad you were here this morning. I'm so glad for what God is going to do through you this week. And I believe that. I believe that he is going to use you to transform someone's life this week. That their life would forever be changed. So as we go, I want to I give you this blessing. Would you stand and receive it? May, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Jesus, pour out your blessing this week. May he make his face to shine upon you and may his grace abound in your life. And may he turn his face towards you and give you peace this week. Amen. You're dismissed.